Oh, great. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Megan Long. I'm a behavioral health consultant for Michigan's Western region with the Michigan Opioid Collaborative. Today, we have Lisa Patterson presenting for us. The Michigan Opioid Collaborative has committed to doing a monthly webinar series, so we hope you will join us for more webinars in the future. During our presentation today, everyone will be muted. So if you have any questions throughout our chat today, please put them in the chat box or you could use the raise hand function and we'll get to them at the end. Also, if um, everyone could take a moment and sign into the chat, um, we'd love your name, your email address, your role and your location and um, we will then know who all is attending today. Um, if you'd like to receive information on our future webinars, um, you can indicate that in the chat as well. Um, for those of you who would like to have CEUs, social work CEUs, I'll be posting that link in the chat, and we'd like for you to complete that survey as soon as possible to receive your credit no later than Monday, February 21st at 4 p.m. The survey will redirect you to the certificate at the end. Um, the MOC is also excited to share that we've been working hard to receive MCBAT credits for some of our webinars, and this webinar has been approved for one MCBAT credit. If this applies to you, I will be putting um, Ashley Bushner, um, an MOC um, co uh, co-worker of mine, um, at the um, in the chat. I'll put her email. And if you could get with her by next Friday, February 25th, that would be wonderful. I'll share a brief um, bit about MLC and what we do here. The Michigan Opioid Collaborative is a grant funded program that helps Michigan providers obtain the education and training necessary to prescribe medications for opiate use disorder. The MOC also provides peer to peer consultation services from physicians with addiction training. A BHC is also available to provide ongoing technical assistance, education and training, and assist with patient consultations. We have six BHCs around the region of the state. One of those BHCs will be contacting you after the webinar is completed today. And if you have any other questions, please reach out to them. We also have um, hepatitis C services, and we um, also, um, have services with great moms um, helping pregnant people um, with substance use disorder. I would now like to introduce our speaker today. Um, her name is Dr. Alyssa Patterson, and she is a clinical assistant professor of psychiatry and neuro neurology at the University of Michigan. Dr. Patterson earned a PhD in biopsychology from the University of Chicago and a certificate of re-specialization in clinical psychology from William James College in Massachusetts. She completed postdoctoral training in behavioral medicine at the Boston University School of Medicine. She is a member of the Consultation Liaison Psychiatry Service at University Hospital in Ann Arbor, where she specializes in treating medical surgical patients who experience psychological factors impeding their medical progress. She is a co-founder of the Michigan Medicine Multidisciplinary PNES Clinic that treats patients with psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. Dr. Patterson is a past president of the Michigan Psychological Association. We would like to welcome Lisa, um, Dr. Patterson and we thank you for your time and I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Megan. Um, appreciate the introduction. It's great to see so many people from all over the state here today. Um, so when I was originally uh, invited to present to this group, I wanted to see some of the other presentations that had been given. So I saw a presentation from Dr. Pooja Lagasetti that talked about <clears throat> gaps in treatment for patients who have had pain and um, opioid um, use disorder. And that really resonated with me as a health psychologist and as a person who works in the hospital. So what I'd like to do today is um, look at some of the opportunities that we have as a system to improve on our multidisciplinary care integration um, for patients with pain. 
And I'm going to be coming at this from the perspective of a health psychologist. And I think um, I saw a lot of folks who um, probably are doing similar types of interventions with patients to some of what I'll talk about today. Um, so I hope this is useful and I look forward to interacting through the chat. So there we go. So our learning objectives today, we're going to look at um, the Pain Medicine Consensus Summit guidelines regarding interprofessional core competencies for pain management. And we're gonna look at why those are important. <clears throat> I'm going to provide an overview of non-pharmacological strategies for pain management and how they interact with pharmacological strategies. And um, I'm going to use this um, framework called explaining pain, or I call it neurobiology of pain education, as an example of some of what we can um, bring to our patients when we're trying to help them embrace the most comprehensive types of pain management. <clears throat> so let's start with looking at how healthcare trainees learn about pain. <clears throat> let's take medical students, for example. They usually learn in a discipline-specific way while they're on their apprenticeships, on their clinical rotations. So they're learning about specific issues that come up, say, on their rotation um, in ortho. Maybe someone comes in with a broken arm, so need to identify the pathological cause of pain there, the broken arm. Then the next step is to remedy the pathology. So put the arm in a cast and then wait for it to heal. And while they're waiting for it to heal, maybe palliative pain medications might be applied. And in theory, then the pain should go away, right? But as we all probably know, the pain doesn't always go away. And um, <clears throat> oftentimes pain is affecting multiple different systems and it's not as easily reduced to the interventions from one discipline. It transcends multiple disciplines. So because of this, a lot of medical schools are now starting to teach academic courses on pain that go across the disciplines, which is a wonderful development. <clears throat> So who besides um, physicians and medical students, who owns pain? I would say pretty much everyone, um, professionally and socially, right? I don't think there's probably any one of us that's not been affected by pain, either in our own personal life or a family or a friend, and certainly in our professional lives. So I've just listed here many of the disciplines that um, <clears throat> I tend to see and interact with in the hospital. Some of these may not be so familiar, like healing touch is something that is offered in the in Mott Hospital. It's a special kind of touch for individuals who are in the hospital. Um, I won't get into the details, but we've got physical therapy, we've got acupuncture, psychology, social work, pharmacy, surgery, medicine, occupational therapy, and child life. <clears throat> So all of those disciplines need to be able to work together in order to provide a good experience for a patient. So when we think about pain management from an interprofessional perspective, um, it has not been something that <clears throat> is readily taught in most curriculums. So back in 2013, the Academy of Pain Medicine published this um, paper that was the result of a consensus summit with um, pain experts. And their goal was to develop a set of core competencies that um, preclinical, pre-licensure health professionals could be taught. And by doing this, <clears throat> it would increase the ability of professionals to communicate with each other and to better address pain. So we're going to look at this, um, look at the different domains here. So we've got the first domain that they identified as a core competency is the multidimensional nature of pain. The second is pain assessment and measurement. Third is collaborative management of pain. Fourth is context of pain management. So how does the social context uh, impact the person's experience of pain. 
So this is um, looking at specifically pain psychology and how a group of psychologists got together to create a nationally recognized set of core competencies. This was from 2018. <clears throat> Not to say that psychologists weren't doing good work in pain management already, but there didn't exist a national standard. Um, so these competencies that came out of the summit were very useful in terms of organizing the discipline of psychology to um, be more, more, uh, more explicit about what we need to teach trainees. And this, I think, um, is an example, but other disciplines of therapy can also certainly um, tap into the same rubric here. So I'm gonna use this as an example to see how those core competencies might play out for um, an individual, for, for us as professionals taking care of patients with pain. So first off, multidimensional nature of pain. What is pain? This is probably familiar to most folks on the call here. Um, it's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. <clears throat> That's, of course, the International Association for the Study of Pain's um, definition from 2016, and then it was updated in 2020 as well. The thing I like about this is that it really does make room for both the subjective experience of pain and the medical explanations for pain. And I've got this um, article up here. It's an opinion piece written by a cardiologist in the New York Times. And he also is um, validating the idea that pain is not just a purely physical experience, which helps all of us when we're trying to guide our patients um, to understand a more broad biopsychosocial model that I'll talk about. <clears throat> so, with the addition of these, they call them key notes in 2020, um, the IASP furthered the validation of pain as an experience that transcends the purely physical. And it leaves lots of room for subjective experience of pain and also highlights the need to honor and approach pain with humility as professionals caring for patients with pain. Um, talks about the importance of respecting a person's experience of pain. And it um, gives us room to think about pain both as something that's adaptive and sometimes um, not so adaptive. So theories for understanding pain. Um, I mentioned the biopsychosocial model of pain. Most of you are probably familiar with that. We'll just go into it in a little bit more detail here um, to see how it applies with pain particularly. So when we're talking about um, the biological factors that go into experiencing pain, we're talking about musculoskeletal, physiological, neural factors. Um, there could be uh, for example, someone who just ex had surgery, so they might have a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines in their system, which predisposes them to be hypersensitive to pain. So we want to take that into consideration when we're talking with our patients about pain and helping a patient understand that, yes, there is a biological component of pain and that, yes, over time, as they heal from the surgery, those factors should diminish and they should start to feel better. So planting seeds for people, helping them use the information that we have to um, better um, manage their own expectations around pain. So psychological factors um, affecting pain. So we could take, for example, um, an Olympian skier. When an Olympian skier experiences pain after a workout, they might think, wow, I had a great workout. That was terrific. Whereas a brand new skier for the first time might think, oh, my body feels terrible. I hurt myself skiing. My body must be broken. This was not good. So the way that a person thinks about pain can dramatically impact their overall um, suffering and experience of pain. So we want to take that into account. We could also think about um, social factors and whether someone has a supportive environment, whether they have um, 
learned from their social connections about pain in a way that might be maladaptive. For example, one person could be um, taught by their parents that it's important to pay attention to pain and they might be taught how to try to distinguish between um, pain that needs to be treated and pain that will pass and is just a natural part of, of everyday life versus someone else who might have been taught that their pain doesn't matter and it's not important. Someone who's abused, for example, might have learned that um, it's not important if they experience pain. And so physical pain for them might be one of the ways that they try to communicate to the world what their inner experience is. So the long and the short of this is that um, biopsych biological, psychological, and social factors all impact pain. Um, so how do we communicate effectively about pain with patients and with other practitioners? We wanna listen, of course, because um, listening gives us a chance to hear from the patients about what they value, what's important to them, how they think about their pain, and that can give us um, ideas about how we can reach them in the school of thought of uh, meeting a patient where they're, they're at. Also, we want to approach with empathy and compassion. We know that actually empathy in and of itself helps reduce a person's experience of pain and suffering. And we want to um, use the scientific literature to um, influence how the patient is able to understand their pain. And we wanna do this in a way that's um, approachable and, and not overly scientific. We might have to water things down. For other people, we might give them the full on neuroscience textbook version, um, but we wanna make sure that what we're doing is grounded in the scientific literature and patients, of course, very much appreciate it when they hear some sort of credible backing for the interventions that we're providing, especially um, those of us who are providing some of the softer interventions in the field of therapy or um, counseling or coaching. So some of the challenges that I see are patients who come in and have a rigid adherence to the idea that um, their problem is so severe they have a physical disruption and that it's so severe that none of these other biopsychosocial or mind-body interventions will be able to touch the pain that they have. Um, so this is um, important and difficult at times, but most of the time patients are able to get, their, get themselves to a new way of thinking about their pain so that they're not as rigidly adherent to the notion of a stimulus leading to a direct response of pain. Um, and we'll talk more about that. I'll clarify a little bit more as we go along. So the neurobiology of pain education, as I call it, or explaining pain is a framework that is an educational and treatment approach that helps patients reframe the way they think about their pain. It's distinct from cognitive behavioral therapy, um, but it's, it's related. So the idea is that patients can benefit from understanding what pain actually is so that they can move beyond stimulus response and understand that the brain is actually interpreting the stimulus coming up from the body. They also benefit from learning what function pain serves and um, sharing with patients what biological processes are believed to underpin pain is also another way that they can deepen and enrich their understanding of their experience of pain. So this model draws on educational psychology and it helps patients shift away from the primary focus on disease, injury, and suffering. Um, so pain in this model is seen as an alarm that signals the need for protection in some way. So why would we want to teach patients about pain and the brain? Um, I've got up here also a couple of the other um, terms that are used for this 
approach to educating patients about pain, pain neuroscience education and therapeutic neuroscience education. So providing a scientific framework for the biopsychosocial pain management is um, something that uh, can really enrich other treatment modalities that patients are likely to get in the within the medical model. We can also um, help them understand in their own particular situations what the function of the pain might be so that they can um, adapt and still live according to their values and find ways to um, get around the pain if that's healthy and if it's safe. Patients um, learn to understand the role of cognitive appraisal. Um, like for example, with the skiing examples, we can um, teach someone to understand that the way they think about their pain can influence how it feels in their body. We also wanna destigmatize the role of subjective perception of pain because many people are taught that if they can, um, if they have a role in perceiving their pain, that it must not be real or it must be fake or, um, they're faking it or they're causing themselves to be a suffer. So we want to destigmatize that. We want people to start thinking about how their brains can actually um, help them think differently and learn new ways of um, managing pain and sometimes even help make pain go away in particular cases that we're going to look at here in a little bit. Um, where the source of the pain is more of a psychological nature. Um, so the other things that uh, come out of using this model for teaching patients about pain, patients are less likely to catastrophize, so they're less likely to have black and white thinking about injury and pain. It decreases fear for patients. It gives them a way of engaging that is not simply um, stuck in a mode where they are um, without any control. It also helps to disp dispel mind-body dualism. So the idea that the mind and the body are completely separate from each other, um, that often gets in the way for patients who are suffering with pain. So we want them to be able to think about how the mind and the body work together to create their experience. Um, and this notion of over-medicalization and reliance on external solutions for pain management, we want to empower patients and help them think about how they can engage with life and with uh, strategies to reduce their pain, rather than um, ha having them focus only on external um, medications or interventions or other people to help resolve their pain. So what might this look like um, when we're talking to a patient? So up here, I have um, a figure that comes from the work of Tor Wager. He um, has done a lot of work on how the beliefs that people have about pain influence their experience of pain. So this right here shows the, in blue, you've got areas of the brain that are active when someone is experiencing pain. And then here in red are areas of the brain that are active when someone is experiencing um, positive belief that they're going to have diminished pain. So I hesitate to use the word, but we're going to talk about it a little later, placebo. So um, these red areas are affected when someone it believes that they're getting a placebo and that they believe the placebo will help. So I wouldn't explain it to a patient that way. With a patient, I might say something like, um, the brain has an active role in helping us understand pain. And I might say that it's not as simple as most of us are taught to believe that I hit my hand and the message goes up to my brain. So the message goes to my brain, but there's also a whole other network of areas of the brain that are interpreting that signal that just came up from the periphery. 
And so um, I, patients are usually open to this idea and it gives them a valid, scientific, credible way of thinking about the fact that yes, indeed, how they feel is changing what they experience. And that that actually is something we want to tap into rather than trying to push it away <clears throat> and diminish it. So um, some of the things that I often hear from patients, um, usually before I get there, um, hopefully not while I'm explaining the um, neurobiology of pain, They'll say, I was told it's all in my head. It's not all in my head. Um, they'll say, my pain is real. They'll say, I'm not crazy. I don't need a shrink. Why am I, why are they sending me a shrink? Um, so I try to help them take this sense of stigma that they feel and turn it into something else. So um, by helping them understand that if they are able to use the idea that yes, in fact, some of the pain perception is in their head, they will be on the cutting edge of um, pain management and they will actually be a lot stronger and feel better about their situation. Um, so I spend time destigmatizing um, my involvement as a psychologist. There's another fallacy that um, gets in the way for folks. Um, the idea that if a doctor gives me opioids, they must be good for me. So again, we want to take that stigma and turn it into a strength. So um, why are people treating me this way? That's what I hear oftentimes. I'm not an opioid addict. I need the medication. I only use it as prescribed. So the antidote that I use for that is um, to talk to patients if the medical providers have indicated that it could be a concern. I'll talk to patients about opioid-induced hyperalgesia. Um, and that usually gets people perked up to the idea that, okay, this is not because people think I'm an addict and they are depriving me of something that I need. The reason that I'm getting fewer opioids or no opioids is because the opioids might actually be hurting me. Opioid-induced hyperalgesia, of course, being the reaction that occurs in the body when someone is on opioids that leads them to experience um, heightened sensitivity to pain. So this is usually a big eye-opener for patients and sometimes can be a shifting point because um, patients will also often say, those meds don't even work. They're not even working. So I'll join with them and say, you know, you might actually be right. Um, and by doing this, we can share in the decision making and help a patient feel that they have greater self-efficacy. So sometimes um, the easiest way to help patients understand this model is to use some of the observations that they're likely to have already experienced. So for example, I'll ask patients if they ever notice that when they're watching TV or when they're having fun with friends, that maybe their pain is still there, but it's not as bothersome as usual. Most people will be able to um, connect with that idea. Um, there are other ways to demonstrate this um, connection between the mind and the body. So sometimes, um, I've seen it done where someone will they'll pinch their hand while using a distraction technique and compare that experience to pinching the hand while not um, using a distraction technique. This is from the um, Stanford Chronic Disease Self Management model of um, disease management. So some distraction techniques, for example, thinking of uh, all of the fruits that start with the letter A or thinking of... Um, all of the flower names that a person can think of. So the idea is, of course, that while pinching the hand, if one is distracting the mind, the mind can't focus as much on the pain. So simple ways to help people um, experience the power of their mind. And then there's the lemon exercise. Uh, some people might be familiar with it, but it's the idea of calling up an image of a bright yellow lemon 
and um, imagining that the lemon is in one's hand, imagining the texture of the lemon, and um, then imagining what it feels like, and then imagining slicing into that lemon with a sharp knife and noticing the juices coming out of the lemon, and then imagining bringing the lemon up to one's nose and smelling it, and then imagining taking a bite out of that lemon. And for many people, their mouths start to produce saliva with this experience. So this is, um, yeah, it's, it's a way to help people understand. I don't use it that much in the hospital just because of the acuity of what's going on in the hospital. People are usually a little bit more open to the biopsychosocial model. They're eager for anything that might help. Um, so another a uh, validating piece of information that I share with patients quite a bit is the idea that social support really legitimately does change our experience of pain. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is a study that was done in 2015. The cold presser test is when a person puts their hand in a bucket of water that's unpleasantly cold. It's, um, it's a little bit above freezing, but it's not pleasant. So they do this under three conditions. One is with someone having social support, so a person next to them encouraging them. One is neutral with no support, but there is a person there. And the other condition is the person keeps their hand in the bucket alone with no one else nearby. So the social support condition was shown to um, decrease the amount of blood pressure changes that happen the heart rate changes and also cortisol reactivity. So they had less of a stress response when they had a supportive person next to them. And in addition to that, the participants reported lower pain ratings and they said it was less difficult and they had to expend less effort than the people in the other two conditions did. So when patients hear about this kind of situation, I hope that they feel they can align with others who are strong and making use of social support in a healthy way, as opposed to feeling that they're weak if they have pain that um, changes willy-nilly depending on who's in the room, which sometimes people can be made to feel that way inadvertently. So the next core competency is pain assessment and measurement. And um, this can vary, of course, depending on the context and depending on um, the needs of the circumstances. So what I want to say about this is that um, sometimes it depends on what is in front of us, what we choose, of course, for the tools. And sometimes I will rely on what the patient's story is, the most important thing can be their perspective on the pain. So um, some years ago when I was working in Boston in a neurology clinic um, outpatient, a woman was referred to me and she had been through a million dollar workup for back pain. And um, I had reviewed her, her record. And as we were talking, getting to know each other, I asked her a little bit about her life. She was single at the time, middle-aged. And then um, I, asked her because I was curious, um, when did your pain start? And she listed a specific date. And I thought that was curious. So I asked her, um, how do you know that it was exactly that date? And um, she had described the pain, by the way, as a nail in the back of her, in, in her shoulder blade somewhere. Um, so I asked her, how did you know it was that specific date? And she said, well, that's because um, that's the day that the man that I love who I was dating, that's the day that he married somebody else. And so to me, this was um, very telling. It sounded to, she had not, they had not found any um, clear structural or medically treatable reason for the back pain. And so to me, this sounded like a clear um, connection between that emotional pain that she was feeling and this back pain that she was feeling. Yet still, in talking to her, she was looking for a physical explanation for the pain. Um, 
And so this is a relevant case because we're going to look a little bit more deeply at how um, the emotional awareness and expression therapy would handle a case like that. So there can be diagnostic momentum and confirmation bias. Um, the pathway that a person takes to get to us in the healthcare system can influence what story is presented with the patient. So for example, um, we often see patients who have abdominal pain of unknown origin. And many of those patients have stopped eating. So when they stop eating, some of them develop gastroparesis. So by the time I'm consulted on the hospital wards, um, you know, it's sometimes um, the patients are saying, well, I have gastroparesis and that's why I have pain. Um, so it can then deflect the root of treatment because now they're focusing again on a medical diagnosis rather than on the fact that they weren't eating and that led to the gastroparesis development. So, um, and some of these patients have um, irritable bowel syndrome, which is um, treatable through, um, through stress management techniques, hypnosis, and also some medications. But given that there aren't any pathological findings in the digestive tract with IBS, it's extremely appropriate to treat them um, behaviorally. So we want to think about that when we're trying to assess and diagnose these patients with pain in a medical environment. Um, here's another uh, systemic issue uh, with treating pain. Um, these are the Michigan Medicine Low Back Pain Guidelines from 2020. So about 80% of people will have acute low back pain at some point in their lives. And for 90% of those folks, um, within six weeks, their pain will resolve. So that's terrific news, right? Um, sometimes the best thing for the medical system to do is just get out of the way, reassure people, and let their bodies heal and provide them with some sort of palliative pain treatment along the way without doing any heavy-handed interventions. Um, so some of you may be aware that that's not always what happens, right? Um, this slide here demonstrates um, the findings of a study done in 2015. Individuals who had workups for other reasons, not back pain, had imaging done. This is their age here along the top. So 20 years of age, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. And these are the um, findings on imaging that was incidental. So I'll just interpret it here. So at 50 years of age, 80% of the people who didn't have any back pain symptoms had uh, demonstrated disc degeneration on their imaging, disc bulge. Um, so at 30 years of age, the 30 year old group, 40% of them demonstrated a disc bulge. So um, the idea here is that there may be anomalies within a system that don't necessarily translate into pain perception. And so it can be helpful for us to help the patients and um, our colleagues, for all of us to think together about what is the most likely explanation of someone's pain. And if there isn't a clear reason to suspect uh, physical damage, then um, we should help guide the patients to avoid iatrogenic harm. So one of the things that I've seen in the hospital is um, surgery done to correct an abnormality. So a disc bulge that wasn't necessarily causing any pain. But of course, in the people who seek surgery for back pain, they are having um, pain. And so there could be a misattribution of the pain to the disc bulge. So a surgeon can go in, clear up the disc bulge, and then the pain persists. Um, so the mechanical problem has been corrected, but 
now that surgical teams don't have anything else to offer because the patient is um, doesn't have the anomaly anymore. So this can create a cycle that leads to um, multiple surgeries and then failed back surgery syndrome. And I see um, part of the value of interprofessional care is that we can um, help prevent this from happening. So why does this happen, right? Healthcare providers wanna help. Learners want to practice their craft that they're taught and we also have an issue with eminence-based versus evidence-based practices. Um, people do what they were taught to do. I learned certain things from my mentors. A surgeon learns from his or her mentors. Um, and then there's a lag between research and clinical practice. So the research might be showing that there's not a correlation between a certain anomaly on imaging and pain but it takes 10 to 15 years for that information to work its way into clinical practice. So uh, we wanna be careful about that and we as teams can think together about these issues. So management of pain, how is pain relieved? This is the good stuff, right? Um, Evidence-based treatment options for pain are um, where we wanna focus our efforts, right? And um, we want to have shared decision making with the patients and with um, other team members. And we want to develop comprehensive integrated treatment plans and promote self management. And we want to keep consistent treatment planning across inpatient and outpatient settings. So let's look at the biopsychosocial or the behavioral medicine models of pain management. So we've got self-management and empowerment. So sometimes I will help prime a patient for thinking about a time when they were very successful or a time when they were able to manage their pain successfully. And um, in general, the psychological, biopsychosocial aspects of pain management are helping people develop broader perspectives on what their pain experience can be. So uh, we've probably all heard people say, well, my pain is 100 on a 10 point scale and it never changes. And none of this stuff is going to help me. So by tracking their pain, we can help them um, start to notice that, oh, well, maybe it is a little bit better when I'm watching my favorite TV show or when my grandkids come over. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of these because I think people are probably pretty familiar with um, most of this stuff. Um, but these are some of the important tools that we rely on in mind-body approaches. Um, so pain management, the interagency task force report from the USDHHS in 2019, I'm just putting these up here um, as a sampling of the evidence-based psychological approaches that came out of that report, behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, accept acceptance and commitment therapy, mindfulness-based stress reduction, emotional awareness and expression therapy, self-regulatory or psychophysiological approaches. So Howard Schubner is a physician here in Michigan and Mark Lumley is a psychologist. They work together and they've developed this emotional awareness and expression therapy, which is basically short-term psychodynamic therapy for pain treatment. Um, Howard himself suffered pain significantly, including IBS. And so um, if you ever get a chance to hear him speak, he's a wonderful speaker and um, very entertaining. And they talk about how there may be a physical injury that occurs at some time. And that physical injury can end up precipitating chronic pain through the emotional focus on that physical injury. And so psychological pain ends up being focused and perpetuated through the physical body, which probably has something to do with the way that our um, culture stigmatizes psychological pain, but not so much physical pain. So most people would rather have, um, well, I don't know if I can say that exactly, but it seems that there is a sense that physical pain is more legitimate than psychological pain. Most of the folks that I see don't want to be accused of having psychological pain so much. Um, so 
clinical care, how does context influence pain management? We want to identify factors that facilitate or interfere with effective pain um, evaluation and treatment. So there are individual factors. Um, how does the person um, feel in life in general? Are they confident in their ability to get things done? Are they um, somebody who depends on others? Do they want to have a lot of information about what's happening to them? Or do they prefer to just lay back and let the medicine do its trick? Social factors, again, isolation or connection to others. Is their pain uh, being used in some way, uh, subconsciously or consciously, to connect them to other people? Sometimes that can happen inadvertently, or they can feel shunned by other people because of their pain. And then systemic and um, financial factors we'll look at here. So individual characteristics and circumstances, education level, socioeconomic status, race, gender, all of these things can influence um, how uh, pain plays out for a person. Oops. So um, looking at sort of an overview of the factors that we want to consider holistically when we're working collaboratively to um, treat someone with pain. We wanna figure out, and this of course, I as a psychologist rely on my medical colleagues to help figure out what's the nature of the pain. Is it medically treatable? Is it from muscle tension and other physiological factors like loss of sleep or sleep deprivation and stress? Are they, um, tensing their muscles and causing back pain because of that. Um, emotional pain and psychological suffering. Um, is there anything that we can do to intervene if that's part of their um, presentation of pain? And the time course of the patient's pain. Are they still within that six week time period for the low back pain or has it been two years? And if so, what have they already received? Have they received non-opioid medication options? Um, is the pain and distress caused by opioid side effects? Um, so I'm going to skip over these in the interest of time. So what do we do about treatments that are outside of the medical community with or without scientific randomized controlled trial-based support? Um, I once met someone on an airplane who told me that Reiki had saved his life. After all kinds of medical interventions, Reiki was the thing that worked for him. And at the time, I thought, well, Reiki is not really evidence-based, but far be it for me to tell him that that's not what happened. That's what he believed happened. So as far as I was concerned, okay, great. Um, Reiki doesn't seem like something that's likely to um, harm someone. Um, so which treatment for chronic pain is best and has the most scientific support? Um, we, I've got listed here as many as I could think of, um, gabapentin, acetaminophen, Alexander technique, cold packs, cannabis, endocrine targeted therapy, weight loss, yoga. So patients, family members, and physicians from different disciplines, um, will all report varying degrees of belief and evidence that these things work. Um, this is a, an article that a colleague Hans Schroeder and I just put in the conversation. That's an active link. Uh, I'll send the uh, slides out. Um, talking about placebo, which placebo, in my opinion, is really just positive expectations, provider-patient relationship, and rituals of care. And um, it's surprising to see how many disorders are positively impacted by um, the placebo treatments. This is another source for placebo information. And here, um, I'm proposing to reframe the question, not which treatment is the best and has the most evidence, but which treatment might be right for this patient at this time, um, given that not everybody has access to the same treatments and not everybody wants access to the same treatment. Somebody might be in the Amazon, they might have access to a shaman for hit healing, or someone might be living in Ypsilanti and have access to an academic medical center very close by. So we want to join with patients and offer them what works for them as long as we also make sure that they are not being harmed 
or um, taken advantage of by treatment or missing an important medical treatment. Um, I think uh, I'll end right here um, looking at just some of the initiatives of Michigan Medicine. An institutional initiative called Rewrite the Script has brought more focus and attention to non-pharmacological strategies for pain management. And um, looking at future directions, multidisciplinary pain management, we don't have all the solutions, of course, but I think education, implementing those pain medicine consensus summit core competencies for pain management across disciplines and training more professionals to fill pain management treatment gaps will be very useful. And expanding the use of the neurobiology of pain, explaining pain framework with patients can also be very helpful. Um, and embedding pain care specialists, which it looks like several of you are. And I'm gonna end right here so that um, we have some time for questions in the chat and discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Patterson. You're welcome. That was wonderful. Um, we do have two questions in the chat so far. Um, and so in the sake of time, I think we'll start with those two. Folks, if you have other questions though, please feel free to put them in the chat and we can get those in writing um, to Dr. Patterson and she can answer those for us and we can get those answers back to you. Um, the first question, um, while folk, other folks might be thinking of questions, the first question was where does chiropractic care fit within this integrative model? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. I was asking myself the same recently because I hear people report that chiropractic care is helping them all the time. And I used to, frankly, have a bias against chiropractic care. I have now um, completely changed my thinking on it because uh, our CTs don't always demonstrate everything we need to know about healing. And there's a lot more art to healing. So, um, uh, and someone could say the same about psychology, right? Like RCTs don't demonstrate what I'd, so it was ignorance on my part. So I would say that for people who have a chiropractor that they trust and feel safe with, um, it could, it could fit right in. Um, I, there may be people who are, I, yeah, I don't know enough about chiropractic, but my basic op openness now is if it works and it's not going to harm somebody, Let's, let's let them do it. <laughs> Great, thank you. Our next one, um, quickly, it says, in my experience, medical providers have tested changes in expression of pain based on distractibility. Assuming that if the patient is distractible on exam, that isn't real pain, is that a bad way to assess pain? Yeah, that sounds like a loaded question. I, I would absolutely... Um, yeah, that's exactly what we're trying to avoid, right? Good for the patient. If they're able to be distracted and they're focused on the doctor who they trust and respect and their pain feels a little bit less intense for a moment while they're being distracted, great. Let's use that. Let's point it out to them. Let's help them um, make, make the most of that rather than poo-pooing them and saying, oh, well, look, your pain's not really real because you didn't suffer the entire time that we were together. That, that seems a little opposite of what we're trying to do. Wonderful. Well, we'll, we'll leave it at those two questions. Um, and if, um, if anyone else has questions, please put them in the chat because um, we would love to get those questions answered for you. We'll get them to Dr. Patterson um, as soon as possible. Um, we want to thank Dr. Patterson for her time and thank everyone for your time today um, as we're just close to the one o'clock mark. Um, a behavior health consultant from the Michigan Opioid Collaborative will be following up with everyone here today. Um, and so if you have any other questions or additional information that you need, um, then please feel free to um, reach back out to your BHC. Um, the webinar has been recorded. And um, if you would like a copy of it, um, we can get that at your request. Um, the Michigan Opioid Collaborative website is down for the moment. Um, and so we would be happy to assist you with that um, if, if you would so choose. Um, so again, thank you all for attending and have a great rest of your day. I am gonna post, um, share my screen and post some of the QR codes and the CEU information as well. Um, and I'll stick around for a moment um, if anyone else needs any questions or concerns. 
And we thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you. Megan, I can stick around for a minute or so also in case there's anything else. Oops, looks like we're okay. I'm going to, all right. Thank you. I'll sign off too. I have a question about the CEU certificate. Sure, go ahead. I finished the eval and it said click here um, to get your CEU certificate. And then it just said, thank you for finishing the survey and it closed. So does that come later, the certificate? Or are we supposed to be able to get it from that? Because if so, it's not working. Yeah, you're supposed to be able to click on it and it should open in another window. So it might be a pop-up issue. Or yeah. you might have to try it in a different um, browser because it should just automatically pop up. I'm not sure how to do it because it just took you to a screen that says, we thank you for your time spent taking this survey. Your response has been recorded. So I'm not sure how to even open up what you're talking about. Because <laughs> it said click here for the certificate. You said you clicked it and then it took you to this screen and there's nowhere to go from here. So you have a back button, maybe. Try that. Nope, that just took me to that just opened a new blank tab. Um, oh my goodness. I saw somebody else in the chat box said that there was an issue with the certificate as well. So I'm not sure that this is unique to me. Right. Like, yeah. Sure that that. So I don't know what their issue was, but. I took the eval. Um, let me see what the, okay, yeah, it looks like we've got people who aren't having any issues on their phone. Um, if anyone else is on and has done the Qualtrics survey, can you uh, let us know if it's worked for you, um, especially if you've done it on a computer? I mean, do you just want me to redo the evaluation again, or? Um, you don't have to do that. Go ahead and you can shoot me an email. My email is both in the chat and up on the screen, and I can send you one. Um, is this Ashley that I'm talking about? Yes, to? Ashley. Okay. Sorry, I should have specified, yeah. Okay, I figure because I see your picture, so I'll just shoot you an email. Yeah, go ahead and shoot me an email. I apologize for the inconvenience. I'm not sure why that is. 
Yeah, as long as I can get my certificate, I don't care. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We, we want to make sure that you're able to do that. Okay. Um, I know we have a question in here about RNs. And from what I understand, um, RNs are able to get the CME, which is that QR code. So if anyone is listening for that. Um, okay, I'm going to try it here myself just to try to troubleshoot it on my end. Yeah, I'm using Chrome on my computer. It's a Windows computer and it has popped up just fine. So I'm not sure what the issue is. Yeah, and um, I didn't use Chrome with this where I usually would, but it's like whenever I click a link, it auto populates to a different thing. And I just sure, yeah, I totally that. understand that. So maybe it's just not compatible with this, but I don't know. I sent you an email, so. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I apologize about that. I'm not sure what the issue was, but I'll go ahead and get you your certificate. Okay, thank you. You got it. Thank you, Marsha, for uh, that information. So it looks like it's working for some folks, but not working for other folks. So if you are somebody who it didn't work for for some reason, um, go ahead and email me. Again, this is Ashley Bushner. Um, my email is asbushne at med.umich.edu. I know it's a mouthful, so it's in the chat as well. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure, of course. I just, I put in my evaluation and then I got my certificate, but it doesn't have a name on it or my license. Do I just add that in? Yep. Yeah, you should be able to just edit it to add okay. it in. Um, oh. We just have to put a generic one in there um, so that whoever obtains it, they can just get their, they can put their own information in. Okay, I don't think I can put the... It's not a fillable form from what I could see. <clears throat> so I'll just write it in <clears throat> and then scan it. Is that okay? A, will that work? Yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> but I mean that's that's totally fine. I mean it's a it's an approved um I, I get it directly from the state themselves, so it's their certificate, so they'll recognize it. Okay, perfect. Good. Thank you. No worries. Thanks, Keith, for the information. Ashley, you want to hang for about two more minutes and then yeah. um, we can we can go ahead and get on with our day. Okay, it looks like some yeah, it looks like it's working for some and Mary. Mary, if you're still on, would you unmute and explain the situation a little bit more? Um, Mary G. I don't see her still here. Okay. I'm going to try to like print out the transcript so that I can just look. Okay, I think she, it looks like she is still here, Mary. Mary, if you can hear us, you mentioned the October 7th date. Yeah, she might not have access to, to chat to voice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. October 7th is the date. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the, the certificate that generated from the link that we sent, and I'm not seeing October 7th as a date. You can make a note for her BHC as well. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I'm probably gonna print out the chat and just go through line by line to make sure that everyone okay. who 
Uh, oh, she's not able to talk. Try it again, and it brought up a different evaluation. My goodness, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> Technology, right? Yeah, it's supposed to make things easier. Um, so I'm going to post the link here and just see why would it bring up a different evaluation? Bria's not still on, is she? I don't see her on here. No. All right, I think it's just you and me. <laughs> Jesus, I don't what know what's going happened? on. I don't, honey, I'm done. I'm just talking to Ashley. You can come out. It's just me and Ashley now. A kind, a kind of. We're just gonna bitch about this for a minute. Oh my um, god, this was supposed to like solve problems that were created right. last time. Yeah. Um. And now these are a whole host of different problems. Yeah, and I'm just not very technically savvy. Have so. you clicked on the link to check it out at all? No, but I can. Okay, go ahead and bring it up on your side if you want to just click on it from the PDF I sent you or that you have up. Because I am not experiencing any of these issues. But I also didn't experience any of the issues that we had last time. So do I have to fill it out in order to get it to go? Yeah, you have to fill out. Just like put like test or, I mean, if you need social work CEU, you can go ahead. No, I don't. I guess I can stop recording. <laughs>